word, turn with me to John chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 6 through 13 this morning. Here's what the word of the Lord says. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light and the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed In his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. I want to tag the text for our exchange this morning, bearing witness to the light, bearing witness to the light. On April 18th, 1775, Paul Revere went on his famous midnight ride. His ride was to warn the colonial militias of the impending engagement with the British forces. He rode through the towns to bear witness to the coming battles. He he wanted people to know what was about to go down. Fun fact, though, to our knowledge, though, Paul Revere never said the phrase, the British are coming. Uh, to warn the colonists. But Revere, among uh, a few others, were people who bore witness to the realities of what was about to happen. And in a similar manner, John shares how the other John serves as a forerunner to bear witness about the Son of God. See, the prologue of John's gospel presents for us a rich understanding of who Jesus is. And now John is transitioning to helping us understand who he is by making an affirmation that Jesus did really come. This this is a reality that we need to reckon with in our own lives. We need to seek to understand and live in light of. It's interesting here because as John builds his case, he's helping us to understand the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He, He wants us to understand how the incarnation of Christ changes everything. This is John's case. He's trying to say that we're all bearing witness to Jesus and who he is. And we want to share that glorious news with other people. That leads me to point number one this morning. We are witnesses. You and I are witnesses. Verse six says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John turns the corner of his discussion to begin to validate Jesus and his claims. And and the way that he does that is he wants us to know that there's someone else who went before him that's even validating all these things that Jesus is saying about himself. If you've ever been through the home buying process, you are aware of all the verifications that are necessary to prove your income. Oh man, it can be a pain at times to go through all those things there. You're like, do y'all really need to know that? Like I told you I got a job, right? But they keep checking. They, they want the pay stubs. They want to email your company. They want to see how much you made for the year and the month because they want to bring all of those factors together. Why? Because they want to verify who you're saying that you are. In the same way here, John is using John the Baptist to help to verify who he is. This is John saying, can I get a witness? He, he decides to bring his own witness to bear in this moment so that we couldn't just say, well, Jesus is just making this up, or, or people can't just say, well, John, you're just making this all up. He's like, okay, y'all been talking about John the Baptist. Let me tell y'all about him as well to bring him into this conversation. The other gospel writers as well point to John the Baptist as a forerunner, and so John himself is fitting into this same narrative. It's verified in Mark chapter 1, verse 4. It says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. That's Mark's account. But in Luke, I mean, Luke does it in Acts, actually, and he verifies the ministry of John the Baptist as well. Um, And so this is what he says in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. It says, so one of the men who has accompanied 
us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. They're talking about disciples right now. This person had to be with us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness of his resurrection. So even the early disciples verified the ministry of someone who actually had walked with Christ to have witnessed what happened with John. So there's a case that's being made that you can even trust John as a witness. Verse 7 says he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. If you just think in this moment, being sent by God is a, is a big deal, right? Um, those words are not few and far between in Scripture. We see it in a, a few different moments where God sends a prophet to share good news with people. And, and so throughout Scripture, we see this account. We see that, that God sent Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah to be mouthpieces in these moments to bear witness to the good news of how God wants to change the world. And John was commissioned. And in obedience, he goes, and he's a witness of the glorious news. In the original language here, this word witness has a sense of a, a courtroom factor here. If I can bring us into reality for a moment, the past few weeks, much of the world has been watching, waiting, and anticipating the verdict of Derek Chauvin in his trial. But in a court trial... They bring a witness to give a testimony of the account of that day or to testify about the integrity of the witnesses or even just information involved in the case. So what have people been doing? They've been watching testimonies of witnesses of what had happened so they can put it all together. But here's the interesting thing. In the same way this is a courtroom term to bear witness to an event, John's lifetime didn't have iPhones or cameras that could record these moments. They had to rely upon the testimony of people. What's different about this? Think about it. It's actually crazy. You actually have to believe what people say is true. Think about that. So when they come into a courtroom, they're, they're making a testimony. They've seen something. They've witnessed something. And we've lost that in our, in our world today, right? That you believe that people can actually be truthful. And we do this with our neighbors and everybody else around us all the time. Now, that was not a statement on the case. So don't try to go there. You hopefully understand the point of the illustration. Is that we're bearing witnesses in a courtroom trying to understand. And what John is doing right here, he's saying that John was a witness. He could testify. He can give an account of what had happened. See, commonly throughout Scripture, we see the necessity of two or three witnesses in various situations. We see that all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, two or three witnesses verify. And in the same manner here, John makes his case about Jesus. He makes his case from his perspective. He makes his case from John the Baptist's perspective to help us to understand this moment because he wants to verify the truth. The truth matters here, the truth about Jesus. So John wasn't testifying for no reason, but he actually believed that through him all men might believe through who Jesus, all men might be able to come to faith. And that was the influencing um, John's testimony. That's what was driving him. This is how God started a movement of Jesus followers going back to John because he wanted to testify about who Jesus truly is. And in a similar way, we too are called to be these witnesses. We have to bear witness to the testimony that Jesus is who he says he is. And because he's changed us, it's going to change everything about us and how we engage the world. See, often we've relegated the role of witnesses to being an unimportant role in the Christian life. And, and this word witness is a little bit different than just evangelizing, but your, your whole being is bearing witness to this reality. And that's something we need to think about, that, that we are called to be these witnesses. We're called to give an account verbally, but also to live it out in a way that our whole lives and beings are this witness. See, John declared the good news of the light so much so that people even started to get it twisted and believe that he might be the light. In other words, John was so convinced by Jesus that he just wanted to keep sharing and keep sharing, and people thought something was special about him. So as followers of Jesus, do you identify your own self as a witness, someone who's called to bear witness about the light? I mean, it's not like the courtroom where you can choose whether or not if you, if you want to go on the stand. But like if you are a follower of Jesus, this is part of your identity. You are a witness. What is coming to bear with your witness? What are you giving off by your witness? 
How, how is this actually impacting those around you? How, how can you seek to live a life that does not neglect this part of your identity, but you move forward in a faithful way? I mean, just think about it for a moment. When is the last time you've told someone about the light coming into the world? I mean, have you mentioned your faith at all recently about how Jesus is changing your life? I mean, I'm, talk, I'm talking about your, your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, your family. I mean, just anyone. I mean, even that point where somebody wants to turn the conversation for you and like bring up something about faith and God, and you're like, no, nah, I'm, I'm steering away from this one. I mean, you've, you've felt those moments when you felt the, the Holy Spirit and pressing upon you to have a conversation, but you want to turn a blind eye. Have you even placed yourself in spaces so these conversations can even happen? See, I've learned over time, and I think this text alludes to it as well, that there's probably a reason that we are not effective in our witness. You know, we talk about it all the time, like, I just don't have the same, like, giftings as other people. That's why I don't share my faith. Um, I, you know, I just can't communicate in the same way as other people. But bearing witness is more than just your verbal proclamation. Your verbal proclamation is a part of it, though. But it's your whole life is bearing witness to the reality of how Jesus changes everything. And that's falling in alignment with what John is trying to help us to understand in this text. He wants us to see Jesus clearly and then clearly how Jesus changes everything about our lives. Verse 8, as we turn the corner here, it says, He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. This leads us to point number two. Our response to the light defines our witness. Our response to the light, how we view the light in our own personal lives will define the way that you will witness. And this might be something that, that we walked through this morning that for you, you thought you wrapped your mind around what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world, but you never thought about how it changes even your own personal witness. See, John is clear to remind us that John was not the light. John wasn't. Jesus is the light. And Jesus came to bear witness about the light. I mean, John came to bear witness about the light. This reminds me of us oftentimes. We like to tell stories about impactful people and how they have served as lights. I mean, just think about it. You're like, oh, man, man, they're, they're such a kind person. They're a great person, you know. I mean, they're such a light to our community, to our society. I mean, we, like, we like, muddy the language all, like, everywhere, right? Like, somebody does that one kind act and they're a light, right? And so I'm talking about that. But we get it twisted at times because we tell people that they are the light of the world. Not that Jesus is the light of the world. And how we view the light will determine and define our witness. I mean, John was a faithful witness. He was getting at it. And even him himself looked back and said, well, actually, I'm not the light he is. And we, we get this from texts like, we are the light of the world, you know, the city set on a hill. That's referring to the church collectively in Jesus as the head of his church. Now, we, re we are representatives of him, but we need to understand this in the right light. Because too many times we place our faith in those who serve as representatives of the light more than we trust the true light. Let me say that for those in the back. Make sure you hear me on this, right? You place your faith so much in those people that are walking before you, maybe people within the church, that when they fall, you start giving up on the true light. Let me, let me say it another way. Look, so you place your faith so much in others and that they're a good person and they look like Jesus that you actually miss out on Jesus changing your life and him bearing witness of the, to the light to you. Jesus is a light. It changes everything. And for maybe for you in your life, you've bought into that capacity that you are the light. You are the person that changes everything. And friends, you might have missed out on the richness of Jesus because all of that's about you. The world needs you to change the world. Think about it. But what John says here is Jesus. How we view the light will determine our witness. See, we settle for the radiance of lamps, candles, and LEDs when the sun is on the horizon. And some of us are just content with that. We don't want to bear witness to the sun all that he brings to the world. Those things put a dent in the darkness, 
But the Son of God, as what we see throughout the, his word, overpowers the darkness. Verse 9 says, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And so John's making this case for Jesus. He's saying it that Jesus is this true light. Because we've seen a bunch of many lights before, yet there's nothing, I mean, there's something different, though, about the self-disclosure of God being imminent among us that gives off an incomparable light. But this is why we struggle with those when they fall. Because we've located the light in the wrong place. See, only Jesus can enlighten us to see the world in a different way. And it's through his light shining on the world. In the original language here in this text, the word, uh, the word for world means cosmos. And, and John is using this word in three different ways in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I want to break down those three different ways those are being used because it's helpful for each line that we see. First, he uses it to show the creation of the world through Jesus. So Jesus brought the world into existence. The second way is that he uses the word to show how Jesus enlightens all peoples of the world, which is different than God primarily working through Israel. So he's, he's building a case that the Gentiles are going to be grafted in, and Jesus is the one who shines light to all of them. So it's more of a general bearing of the light. And third, he uses it to describe the wickedness and rebellion that marks humanity. This is where we get the term worldly. Okay? So John has all of these at play, and within this word cosmos is, is, is this, this rich, deep word that's helping us to understand this. And we see the, the third phrase at play in this line, and John chapter 4, verse 42 helps us understand this. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world, the one that comes to save us from this world. So what we see here in this text is that John is saying the true light comes and he is the one who changes the world. He can unite the world in, in many different ways that are unfathomable to the average person because Jesus is the one who shines his general light through creation and he radiates his salvific light at the cross. Jesus is the one who sits at the center of redemptive history and we need him. Therefore, the question for us to respond to is this. How are you going to respond to Christ's entrance into the world? See, we all have a decision to make because he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. This is verses 11 through 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Our text says that the light shines, but all do not respond in the same way to that light. Typically, we will couch this type of text into two different types of groupings, the world and the church. And I would assume many of you in here would be like, well, you know what team we're on. We're the church. Yet throughout Scripture, we see uh, three groups, in, particularly in the Gospel of John, that Jesus engages. And I think as John's writing this, he has all three of them in their pur his purview. Jesus encounters the religious, the irreligious, and Christians. See, clarity on terms is vital. Because all these groups sit within the visible church, but only one is a member of the invisible church. Meaning those who have experienced spiritual rebirth, and they've been changed by God's grace. Let's look at the irreligious. Irreligious people object to God and denounce Christ as Lord and are spiritually and morally depraved, just like the rest of us. People in this camp look for and desire truth, but do not know where to find it. Maybe that's you right now. You're, you're here today, and you're skeptical of Christianity. You're trying to figure out whether or not you should even follow Jesus, and you're just trying to figure out what is the source of truth in this world. For example, they might say, we're supposed to be good people. They say we're supposed to just do the right thing, but where do you get those good people or right things from? What, what is your definition of good? These individuals with every good desire within them want to do good, but are still okay with measures of darkness because the darkness can still cover their sins. 
See, the, the darker it is outside of us, and we, when we point to that darkness in the world, we do this often. We say, oh, man, the world's just going downhill. You know, it's all dark out there. This is, this is why the world is going down this way. This is why my life is this way. The more you do that, the more you point to that darkness outside of us, we believe that we have less of a need to even look within ourselves. That goes for all of us. The bad in the world is out there, not within us. We therefore believe that we can produce the good on our own. But the religious coddle the same ideas. The religious. Religious people acknowledge there is a God, but are distant from his movement in actual history. Think about that. They acknowledge his transcendence without experiencing his transformation. I mean, man, yeah, I know God is there. I know he does good things. I know he cares for us. But that's it. Jesus came to these religious people early on in ministry. They would quote to him the law and the prophets, but even miss the relational nature of God. They nuanced the written word, but missed the heart of the written word. Let me say it another way. You can know the text. These cats were even trying to tell Jesus about the text that he inspired. And many of us do the same types of things. Oh, we know the text. You start using the text for your own gain, but you miss out on the heart of the text. I've known many of people who can, who can quote the book of Romans, tell you the Romans wrote, but they don't know the God of the Romans. And just think about that. And Jesus is pointing at them saying, look, you don't understand the heart of this. I'm the pursuit. I'm who wants to know you. And Jesus is that representation here on earth, God himself here for us to understand that God wants to pursue us in relationship. The religious struggle to see Jesus as the true light because they hunger for the glory themselves. Because if you believe Jesus is the true light, it takes away all the glory from you. It's easier for us to say, well, no, no, I'm bringing something to the table. I'm changing the game. My, my job needs me to be this light. My neighborhood needs me. No, friends, Jesus is far greater than you. They need Jesus. We need to boast about the light. We do have a responsibility there. The religious often bank on their works and their actions to stand uh, justified before God. In many ways, they are the light. They are the messiahs, and they want to be worshipped. And faith is relegated to religion and not relationship with God. And they often miss out on the person and work of Jesus. Let me give another example of that practically for us. You know, maybe you come to church and you get upset when people don't notice what you do for the Lord. Oh, y'all didn't see what I just did? And you waiting for them to give you the affirmation? That's an example of you being glory hunger yourself. And you wanting that. But John, I mean, many people are coming to faith. He could have been like, yeah, yeah, I'm a part of this. This is my team. He says, no, there's one greater than me. He says in another text that I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals up. Friends, how do you think about this? Do you tend to be more religious in your view of Christ? Often they view Jesus as a light, but live in fear and turmoil to convince others that they are on the same team as a true light. When you know you've been changed by the light, you don't have to fight to be on his team. Your works aren't going to do anything about it. You've been saved through his grace alone. And his light has transformed you. It's exposed you. changes everything. Now the Christian. Christians receive life since they believe in Jesus. And the word believe in this text means to have faith in, to entrust in, and to rely upon. Followers of Jesus place their faith in Jesus and his work on the cross. They realize it's not by their works, their actions, or religious standing that they are brought into the household of faith, but it's through Christ and him alone. Christians trust the light, hear me, to expose darkness inside of them and outside of them. That's different than the religious. Expose it outside, but don't expose it, expose it inside. See, we acknowledge our own brokenness and implications of being in a sin-ridden world, and the light is constantly exposing us and reminding us of God's grace and mercy to redeem. 
We're not focused on putting on a front, but we trust the one who's already made the payment on our behalf. Because it's Jesus who came to disrupt our rebellion and to restore our relationship with God. It's not our right or our inheritance to become children of God. But we are children because we believed in his name and he has made us new through his grace and mercy. See, how you view yourself in those lights changes how you will bear witness. Because only one is really good news. Two of them are just trying to play it up in life and just trying to live a good life and trying to put on a show. But one is willing to be exposed in your brokenness and being open to your need for the Redeemer to, to redeem. And in particular, I want to speak to those who have been playing religious for a season. You don't want people to see what's inside of you. You don't want to see, you want people to see that there's some things that are being exposed in your life that, that you need only Jesus to redeem. Because it's easier to play religious, to, to play like you have it all together. But in order for us to bear witness to the light, we have to first look inside of us and see how the light is changing us. And if you're ever in a season where you don't really feel like the gospel is not doing something in your life, not changing you, not calling you towards faith, calling you to trust Jesus as a redeemer, maybe you're drifting into this religious category in your own life. And that's where we need to have an awareness. We need to be honest with ourselves and with others. Because how we view the light changes our witness. We can't even talk about bearing witness about the gospel without us understanding how much we need the gospel. Because friends, if we do not see Jesus clearly, we will neglect even being a witness. For us, it's not worthy without the right vision. We might not understand why our world desperately needs Jesus, without us having the right vision for our own lives about why we need the light. 24-7, Sunday through Sunday, all the time. Lastly, this morning, we bear witness to see people become children of God. That's why we bear witness. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. To be effective in our witness, our desires play a significant role. Do we desire for those around us to become children of God? I mean, think about it in the grocery stores, and your conversations, those who do not know Christ, do you actually desire them to know our God, to be brought in? Do we want to see people move from death to life? What I mean by that is this, they're living dead in their sin, pursuing whatever they want to pursue. We want them to experience the fullness of life that's found in Jesus. Do we want to see that happen? Do we just make excuses? Well, you know, they're just lost cause. I'm not going to press into their lives. But do we actually desire for them to know our Lord intimately? Not just know about him, but to know him. How about moving from darkness to light? See, that will only happen if we actually bear witness about Jesus and his work and his ability to change. See, those who share their faith more often than others have a personal awareness of their need for the light and how the light can change lives. That's why early on in your faith, you might have been a little bit more passionate about it. Because you're like, oh, man, I just had this big conversion moment, so I know that I need Jesus. And somewhere along the way, we've borne witness about the light in such a way that it just starts to wear off a little bit. Well, like you have Jesus, you know, he saves you, and then you go about the rest of your life and just build your life however you want to, as long as you don't do bad things. Friends, you're missing it if that's your view of the gospel. Because the light shines. The light changes you. It exposes us. It points us to the need, our need of the Redeemer. See, they can attest to Christ constantly and consistently exposing their sin, and they need him to be the Redeemer. Alone, though, without this, we're just like the world. We turn our face away from God and continue in our own rebellion against him. We contemplate our hearts and we see where we are deviating, even in our own pursuit of God, and we are met by his grace in those moments. See, we proclaim the gospel to our neighbors because we want them to be met by the same mercy. Our desire is for them to join us in the family of faith. We want them to move forward with us. We want to see them with us in the kingdom. 
This is why having conversations about the light is not solely just about what we say, but it's about our whole lives, how we are walking alongside other people. Yes, you need to proclaim the gospel, but you actually need to live like the gospel is changing you. This is why people say Christians are hypocritical at times, because, oh, yeah, they, they want to give me Jesus, but they live like the rest of us. That's what they mean by that, and they're right. They're right. That's not them judging you. It's true. Because we just want to play religious half the time. We don't actually believe that Jesus can actually sustain us, grow us in our faith, that he has the ability to redeem us. See, John has been building this case in chapter 1 that Jesus, since at the center of redemptive history, he changes everything. He wants us to behold him. Friends, do you live as if seeing Jesus clearly changes everything? How you see your sin, why you repent, how you repent, how you care for your family, how you work, why you serve, what you think about. That's the Jesus that John is talking about here, that he's bearing witness about. And all of that changes us because we've been born again, made new. See, a lot of the world has given you life, and now you get to bear witness to the life that he's given you. And it's a good life if you actually trust Jesus. And you actually follow him. And then others will be able to experience what it means to know and to love God well. And they'll want to. It's contagious. When you have a sense of satisfaction in someone greater than you, it's contagious. And this is the moment where the people of God need to be these witnesses. Because someone's changed us. Someone's given us rest. There's someone that we are abiding in. He's the light of the world. He desires others to believe and to trust that he can actually be the source of true life. Got to yearn, though, for people to be made new by God's grace, that they would believe in him. See, we all fall into the three categories mentioned earlier. We're either irreligious, religious, or Christian. Each group deals with the true light in different ways. The irreligious want to deny God as the source of life. They turn from any consideration of him, providing a better path. The religious acknowledge him as the light, but struggle to see how the light changes them on the day-to-day basis. It's easy to do the right thing instead of allowing the light to expose and to remodel. If you ever remodel something, it's painful at times. It takes a lot of time, a lot of work. It takes precision, care, crafting. Some of us don't want to go through that renovation. You'll let the whole house crumble before you allow yourself to be exposed and see what's under those walls. Maybe that's you right now. As long as you put a nice coat of paint on it, you're good. But with inside, you're longing for more. And I want to tell you this morning that that longing that you have can be satisfied through Jesus. The work that he's done, the sacrifice he's made, and the relationship that he establishes with us in the triumph God. The religious justify the light inside of them and not the source of the light. Christians see their need for the light to invade our world and our hearts. There are many things that the light exposes and we desire for him to expose it. And I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. Lord, expose within me anything that's keeping me from finding delight in you. Because you know his grace is sufficient. But there's nothing that's not redeemable. Trust him. Therefore, we believe there is nothing like the light. See, the light might be bright. It might make us uncomfortable at times. But we know we need it. But the entire world needs the same light. And this good news that comes through Jesus.